For God is love, God is love, God is love. Love the Lord, thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, all thy strength, family. Pleasure to be able to stand before you today. Uh, Mike's, uh, as you, most of you know, he's traveling. Gives an opportunity for a few of us others to have, a, have an opportunity to speak to the congregation. I'm glad to be able to be with you today. So, as Christians, kind of written in our Christian DNA is, is we're instructed to be gentle, humble, meek, control our tongues. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the gentle, uh, for they shall inherit the earth. And, and a very similar sentiments given over in Philippians, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Over in James chapter 3, uh, James talks about controlling our tongue. Matter of fact, this is what James Harris talked about last Sunday night. Uh, our tongue is a fire, so beware. Control the things that you say. Take control of your tongue. We're also taught throughout Scripture to bless those who persecute you. Um, in Romans, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And we're given the example of our Lord Jesus when he went to the cross and he remained silent uh, throughout, his, uh, throughout his torment. Acts describes that as like a lamb led to slaughter. He remains silent. And, and that's, that's who we are as people. We're, we're, it seems to me in this congregation particularly, I've seen that we're pretty humble, quiet, not fast, not quick to speak up, quick, quick to, for the most part, control ourselves pretty well. But the purpose of my message today is there are times when a follower of Christ must speak up. There are times when we are obliged to speak up. And the first one of those I want to talk about is in encouraging one another. Go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to use several examples from our Lord to try to emphasize what I'm talking about, but in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 11, soon afterward he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he stood up, then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him his mother. I want to point out two things. Jesus is moved with compassion, and he is the first to speak. He initiates the contact. He's filled with compassion for the situation. He speaks up. He steps forward. Look over in John chapter 4. Different situation, different setting. But once again, Jesus is the first to speak. 
He had to pass through a town of, he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus initiates the conversation. It's not just, I, I, there's so much more here than just Jesus seeking, seeking a drink of water because the context makes clear you don't ask such things. Jews don't ask Samaritans to such things. You don't have anything to do with them. But he initiates the conversation. And if you read the rest of the passage, he goes on to engage with this woman in a deeper level than she's probably had in who knows how long. Because it's clear that she's a troubled woman. It's clear that she's a buffeted soul that, that needs compassion to be shown to her. God's people are people to speak out, to encourage one another, to build each other up, to take the initiative to show compassion to one another. In my own experience, um, I had a situation some years back. Um, one of my sons was diagnosed with a, with a problem, and it was severe. And my wife and I were faced with a pretty difficult decision. Uh, we could go into surgery, take the chance of really crippling him, really damaging him, or leave it alone but take the chance of him dying, you know? And I remember the overwhelming feeling of loneliness. I had friends and family that knew about it, but it was, it was, it was crushing. It was, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. And there are people in this body that are bearing similar loads every day. Medical, family, financial, whatever. But there's brothers and sisters that are bearing tremendous loads and our obligation, we are family, so speak up and reach out to your brother in compassion. Now, we can't be like Jesus. We can't, we can't know that someone's hurting, so what do we do? Well, it seems to me we have to take the initiative we have to take the initiative to speak up and, and take the opportunity to probe a little bit deeper, a little bit beyond how was your weekend, how's work, uh, how's the weather type of type level of conversation. As brothers and sisters, plumb a little deeper into our souls than just that shallow level that, that's so easy for us to get into. 1 Thessalonians, look at me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And focus on verse 11, but pay attention to uh, the context. I'll start reading in verse 8. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put, in on the, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. The punchline is in verse 11. Therefore, encourage each other up and build each other up. 
but what, what's the basis that's behind it? He's saying it's because we are God's people, because we are the saved people of God, because God has set us apart, we should encourage and build each other up. What are you doing in your lives to encourage and build up the church? You know, it was just, it was just last Wednesday in his Devo that Jeff Smith pointed out to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, in verse 25, we focus on the, a lot on the, and, and, and rightly so, on the not forsaking assembling together, but the context of that is let's, how to, let's consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembly as a habit of son, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching near. So I challenge you to speak up, speak up and engage your brothers and sister to, to find out what they are dealing with, where, what's going on with them. Second opportunity, speaking up for what's right, despite the opposition. You know, I'm, uh, one thing that impresses me so with Jesus is he is just fearless. He is fearless in stepping forth and doing what is right and knowing all the while that he's going to have opposition. But, but he puts himself in the in that line of fire, knowing that he's going to have opposition. Look over in John, uh, excuse me, Luke 13. Luke 13, starting in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold... There was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from the bond from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. All his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Jesus stands up for the right thing. He speaks up and stands up for the right thing. He, he, uphold, he, he does what he can to help this woman. And then he speaks up for what is ultimately right. Is it upholding the Sabbath or is it healing this woman whom Satan has had in his hands? And he speaks up despite the opposition, knowing knowing that he's going to get the opposition. Look also over in in John, John chapter 7. Start in verse 1 through 3, and then I'll skip to verse 10. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works you are doing. His brothers are encouraging to, you really should go to Judea. Don't worry. They, don't worry about them, these threats to kill you. You really need to be there, Jesus. Verse 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. Skipping ahead to verse 14 and 15. 
About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He knows fully well what's waiting for him. And I don't know if Jesus was um, uh, just misdirecting these people or whether he had, had to overcome his own human fears and gird himself up to go do what was right, to go teach in Jerusalem. But he does. He overcomes it, and he, stand, he, he does what's right. It seems to me that a lot of us know the right thing to do, but we're afraid. We're afraid to stand up. We're afraid to speak up. I remember a time me and my family were in uh, downtown Anchorage. It was some festival or whatnot. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but there was a, there was a, there was a big crowd. And there was a street, um, street guy that was singing a gospel tune. And it wasn't a, a, a very well-known one. I, I, think, I think it was when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. A lot of us know that one, but out there, not so much, right? But we knew it. <laughs> and we saw him, and we smiled, and we walked past. And later, in conversation, it came up that what we really should have done you stood there with him and sing the praises of Jesus. That would have been glorifying to God. To overcome our fear, our inhibition, or whatever that was that held us back. And stand and sing the praises, sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Instead, we kept walking with the scoffers and with the unbelievers and with the revilers. We walked along with them. I didn't want to make a fool out of myself, but how much more glorifying to the cross of Christ would have been if I had been willing to stand and speak up for the glories of my God. Speak up for what's right. Over in Mark chapter 15, we read about Joseph of Arimathea. And you remember Joseph of Arimathea. He was a big wheel in the, in the Jewish high council. And he was among those that were debating what to do about this Jesus when they're talking about condemning him, putting him to death. Scripture tells us that he secretly was a believer, but he didn't have the courage to speak up. And Mark, it tells us, Mark is the only place that this is mentioned. After Jesus is crucified, Joseph of Arimathea, in Mark 40, uh, 1543, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Man, I know where Joseph's coming from because I've lived most of my life afraid to speak up. And I pray that God gives me the courage, the courage to overcome those natural fears and defend the name of Christ. God, defend the cause of Christ, and to imitate Jesus in defending the weak and defending all that's good. Philippians chapter 1, 27, 28 says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, 
with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you, and that too from God. Walk and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, standing firm and not allowing the opposition to dictate the things that we say that stand up for what is right. But boldly being God's people and speaking up for the things that are right. Third thing. Jesus was single-minded in his mission to bring salvation to mankind. Single-minded. He, 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 if, if you read through the, the, the totality of the scripture, the, the, the kind of the flow of the scripture, you quickly come away with his every waking thought was devoted to his mission and to his purpose. When he's teaching, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. When he says, I am the light of the world, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When he teaches that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And we see in his disciple Paul, a man that's single-minded in his purpose, you see in Peter, a man that's single-minded in his purpose of sharing the gospel message about the world. Is, is, there, is there any doubt, is there any doubt among God's people that God expects us, those that he has pulled from the fire, is there any doubt that he expects us to share the gospel message? To go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation, to go and make disciples of all the nations. Those commandments weren't specifically given to us, but if you, if you, if you, if you weigh the weight of Scripture and the direction of Scripture, clearly it's God's expectation. It's, it's, it's just a fundamental expectation that the saved will speak of the praises of those who, of the one who saved him. I don't watch much uh, television, like ever. <laughs> but um, but when I was home this last May, uh, visiting family, and they watched television, and so I caught a couple uh, minutes of the Sean Hannity show. And by the way, if I do watch TV, I don't watch the Sean Hannity show. But that's what mom and dad had playing, so that's what I watched, right? Um, and the guest was Phil Robertson, uh, you know, the Duck Dynasty guy. Um, the show opens up with Sean Hannity. He's doing, a, you know, kind of a, a, an interview of some sort with uh, uh, Phil, who's back in Louisiana. You know, he's not in studio. He's off camera somewhere. So Sean Hannity says, Phil, you know. And Phil Robertson opens with a really peculiar reply. Sean, the temperature of the water in the Wichita River is perfect. What? What an odd statement, right? Nobody knows what he's talking about, but Sean knows what he's talking about. And he feels obligated to go ahead and explain what's going on. And it turns out, the last time that they had been together, that Phil Robertson had taught him the gospel and was talking to him about being baptized in the Wichita River. And they went on for a minute or so talking about this, about how Sean was really reluctant to be baptized in alligator-infested waters, that type of thing, right? Um, but then they, they, you know, Sean closed, well, maybe next time uh, I'm with you, maybe we'll do just that. And they move on to the main subject they had to talk about. But I gotta tell you, I don't know what your opinion is of Phil Robertson. I admired his courage. Oh my goodness, I thought that was such a courageous act. First off, it's on national TV, and the first words out of his mouth 
or to remind this fellow who he's been talking to. This is not his first conversation, but he's been talking to him and remind him, first things first, what is most important, you need to be baptized into Christ so you can become a child of God. And you can be quite sure that, that, that this wasn't Fox News. This wasn't a segment on baptism, okay? They were talking about something else. I don't know what they were talking about, but he made it his top priority to speak to this man, to remind him about his soul. And I don't believe he'd done it for showmanship either because it was a vague, arcane statement that Sean could have blown off and it must have been just for him. But as it was, he felt obliged to explain it so we can kind of share in what's going on. But it was taking the opportunity that he was given. National TV or not, he took the opportunity he was given to speak to this man about his soul. Wow. <laughs> I want that courage. Romans chapter 1 tells us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What does he mean? I'm not ashamed. I think it means he can't be held back. He will not be muzzled. He will not be muted. But Paul and us must proclaim the power of the message of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 says, We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of of Christ be reconciled to God that's our that's our role as ambassadors it, God's spokesman God's face before the world we remain silent I'm convinced we remain silent because of fear now that takes a lot of forms it's because we feel awkward and uncomfortable or we call ourselves naturally inhibited or shy or introverted or, or because we might get in trouble, but it's fear. It's fear that holds us back from speaking up from the things that, that, we, need to go, that, that we need to say. The purpose of this message is to ask you to overcome your natural feelings of awkwardness and discomfort and inhibition and fear, overcome those things and, and be willing to speak up. I'm not asking you to cease being meek and gentle and humble. We have an obligation to do all those things. I'm, I'm, there's an expectation of holding ourselves in control and not becoming boastful and arrogant, but speaking up say something when the time arises i guess for me oh, through the years part of what i've tell, told myself is that i i play it all through my head okay i'm going to talk to bill and I'm gonna, I'm, this is the way this conversation is going to go, and here's the setting and the ideal scenario, and I work it all up. <laughs> and then nine out of ten times I'll chicken out and wait for another perfect scenario and, and, and walk it all through my head. I'm not asking you, God doesn't expect you to deliver the perfect line or remember just the perfect Bible verse for the, for the moment to deliver at just the ideal time that they're ready. What I'm asking is say something. Speak up. Talk to people. Show them your compassion. Speak up for what's right. 
reach out with the message of salvation. Courage is letting our mind overrule our fears. Just like Joseph, it's not that he wasn't afraid anymore, but he, but he worked up his courage, let his mind overrule his natural fears. Fear is still going to be there, but the mind says, you aren't stopping me today. Folks, that's the message I have for you today. It's the idea of just speak up, say something. Don't wait for the perfect moment or the perfect words, but be genuine and be vocal while you're still being humble and meek and controlling yourself. That's the message I have today. If there's any of you that would benefit from the prayers of the church, then I invite you to please come forward now while we stand and sing this next song. Streams of mercy.